Okay, we are now live on YouTube. So be nice. <laughs> and if you all would, and I'll say this again, um, for Jordan's benefit, if everybody would write their name in the chat, that would be great and make sure that she knows how everybody spells their names and that kind of thing, so. And actually, now that I'm thinking about Jordan, I did send you the, the board list, didn't I? Excellent. I'm just trying to make your life a little easier. So it looks like the only chat option I have goes directly to you, Porter. Is that correct or am I missing something here? So that's a great question. Um, that is true. Um, okay. Now, granted, with this group, it's a little different. But the reason for that is if we did have guests, um, the chat function really is, you know, become sort of a public comment opportunity for people that's beyond their public comment allocation, if that makes sense. So if you need anything, you can certainly chat with me. And in our context, that may not be a problem, um, but that's why we do that. It's being sensitive to the Kansas Open Meetings Act. How do I write my name in the chat? Oh, that goodness. doesn't what am go I doing? Okay, you so exactly. I just hang on, hang on. Sorry, I'm I'm speaking out of all six sides of my mouth, aren't I? Bear with me. I just asked you to do this, and then I just told you you can't do this. Here we go. Let's do this publicly. Now you should be able to chat with everybody for this purpose. I apologize. Hey, I got it now. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Sorry, I was not thinking straight. Um, Jerry, you have a quorum. Um, I did hear from James and unfortunately, well, fortunately for him, he has to do a rehearsal with the Topeka Symphony apparently. So he has a, he has a paying gig, gig. Awesome, okay. Uh, so let's uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, I have 7.32. PM. And do you want to say your meeting notification thing for Porter? Yes, thanks. Um, good evening, everybody. And you all know that I'm Porter Arneal, and I'll be facilitating the Zoom video portion of the meeting tonight. Um, this meeting is being broadcast and recorded on the city's YouTube channel. During the meeting, when you're not participating, please mute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon found on the lower left-hand side of the Zoom menu next to the video icon. Muting your microphone during the meeting will make it easier for everyone to hear. You will be able to unmute if and when you want to speak. In some cases, I may mute or unmute people as needed to minimize distractions during the meeting. Please remember to state your name every time you speak for the benefit of those listening remotely. Um, there are people listening via YouTube, so it helps when you can say your name. You can turn your video camera on or off by clicking the video icon in the menu. Um, for the purpose of this meeting with this group, um, please leave your video on during the meeting. Um, if you need to, you can turn it off um, and still listen to the meeting. Um, and then just turn it on if you're participating in the meeting as well. If anybody is participating by phone, you can click star six to unmute your phone and you can click star nine if you wanna raise your hand to provide public comment. Um, and you probably all know this for Zoom, there are two um, views, speaker and gallery view. Obviously speaker view shows the active speaker while gallery view shows everybody in the meeting. Um, and that is it for me. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Should we go ahead and do a roll call? Yes. 
All right. And, you know, I can't do it alphabetically, so I'm going to do it as I see people on my screen, which is probably in a different order than you see it on yours. But um, I'm Jerry Johnson, the chair of the LCAC. Jordan Martinez. Just say. Here. Present. Mary oh, Dutton. Present. Dina Amon. Present. Welcome. Denise Stone. I don't mute Denise, but I saw I saw your hand. So uh, Marlo. Marlo here. Christina. Here. And Daniel. Correct? Here. So I would introduce the new members, but I'm meeting them for the first time. So maybe it's more appropriate that you uh, do that, Porter. Um, well, I can say that I, I know of Dina um, from past interactions. Actually, ironically, I, I, an email popped up where you and I had discussed some construction noise a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, and I also know that you work at, at Lawrence High School as an art teacher. Um, and beyond that, I will let you introduce yourself and then I can say a little more about Daniel because he and I sit through a lot of Zoom meetings together these days. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dina Amont and I've been a Lawrence resident for more than 25 years now. I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, I am an art teacher, as Porter said, an art teacher at Lawrence High School. I've been there uh, teaching three-dimensional art, Porter, um, for about 18 years now. Um, and let's see, so I've also taught at the Lawrence Art Center and been involved there. I've taken classes at the Art Center there, too. Um, I support the arts. Um, a lot of arts organizations in town here. I know a few of you here in the group. Um, I received my uh, master's degree in visual art education from KU. Um, and I am really pleased to, uh, to be on the LCAC. And Porter, um, uh, yeah, we do know each other because you helped me out doing some research for a public art project, the public art project at the uh, uh, Kansas City Airport way back when. So, yeah. And it's really nice to be here. And I'm really um, uh, pleased to be on the Cultural Arts Commission and hope to be able to serve. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And so with Daniel, um, Daniel works at the United Way, and he and I have been in numerous Zoom calls related to the pandemic because Daniel's been instrumental in many ways. Um, one big one was when we were getting a lot of people making masks. Daniel was the person that was responsible for figuring out how to distribute all of those masks. And, um, and I didn't realize that he is also an artist um, until I learned that he was appointed to the Art Commission. So I'm, I'm very happy to uh, have him join us and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself. Sure, thanks Porter. So yeah, as Porter mentioned, I'm the Director of Marketing and Resource Development at the United Way of Douglas County. Um, and in this position, I do lots of design stuff. Um, I don't necessarily describe myself as an artist, but I've done lots of art. I went to KU for design and I do lots of graphic design type stuff. But in addition to that, I, I have a background in painting and drawing and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I, I used to work at, at Van Gogh where I was a, an art instructor in different capacities over the years. And I, I volunteered there for years. So um, that's kind of my background. And I know a couple of the people who are on here and I'm, I'm happy to be, to be joining the group. Great, welcome, Daniel. Um, and maybe the group can introduce themselves quickly. Um, starting with Jerry. Okay, yeah, I'm Jerry Johnson. Uh, like I said at the beginning in the chair, I've been on this commission for, committee commission for forever now. <laughs> like, I don't know how long, eight years or something. Um, and, uh, yeah, my uh, background is um, I've been connected to the music scene in Lawrence forever. I've lived here for almost 30 years now and uh, yeah, enjoyed 
uh, serving the community by participating on this uh, this commission. So, welcome to you guys. Um, let's see, Mary. Do you want to go next? I'm Mary Doveton. I'm the executive director of Theater Lawrence. I think I'm the only representative of the of the performing arts on the commission right now. Hmm. I, I mean, aside physically performing, <laughs> um, as opposed to music or or uh, visual arts. Um, I've been in Lawrence forever. <laughs> been with the theater forever. Um, and enjoy working with um, such a, a diverse group of artists in Lawrence and, and the creative people and, and uh, folks that, that make up the art scene. Marlo, you wanna go? I'm Marlo Angel and I work at the Lawrence Art Center in marketing and I direct the Free State Film Festival and I'm an independent filmmaker. So I really have a passion for film and media and I've grown to really love visual arts and performing arts from working at the Art Center. So it's been a real joy to be part of this group. Welcome to you both, we're glad you're here. And Denise, whoops, mute, unmute. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. I've been here, I'm from the East Coast, from Fall River, Massachusetts. And this is my 32nd year in Lawrence, Kansas. This is my home. I'm recently retired from KU. I was teaching art education there for 31 years. And now I'm exploring what it means to be retired, which I have to say I'm very happy about. And I have a strong interest in the arts and the Lawrence Arts Commission is a great place. It's a really great commission to be on. And I'm really excited about the new members. Welcome. Yes, so that's me. Thanks, Denise. Uh, Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Walker and I'm the Director of Education at the Spencer Museum of Art. Um, been on the commission, I wanna say five years, somewhere around there. Uh, I been in Lawrence 42 years, it's a long time. Um, so yeah, it's nice to meet you, Daniel, and nice to see you, Dina. Welcome. Thanks, and uh, Jordan? Hi, I'm Jordan Martinez. I'm a recent music education graduate from Gonzaga University. Um, Lawrence born and bred, and um, this is my sixth or seventh month on the LCAC. Um, welcome to our new members. Um, great, that's the board. And Michael Davidson can talk a little bit about himself when we get to his presentation, because he certainly is a, a fixture in Lawrence and part of the, um, the unmistakability of our town. Um, but before we do that, Jerry, I'm gonna turn it back to you and let you uh, walk through the agenda. Walk through the agenda as an execute or as to read the agenda? <laughs> because um, Michael, Michael is in fact next on the agenda. I think we need to approve the minutes. Oh, we do. You're right. I'm sorry. I skipped over that part. Yeah. Um, any comments on the minutes? Any, everyone have a chance to review and does anyone have any uh, changes, requests, change requests? These were the minutes from our from our retreat. They looked good to me. Uh, very nicely done, in fact. Um, so appreciate appreciate that. Christina's last minutes. It's a little bittersweet. Christina's um, opus, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they were wonderful. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second, Does anyone? I guess I can second that. And all in favor, we'll do a raise of your hands. I see everyone raising their hands, so unanimous. Okay. 
Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I got sorry, I got out of order. It's okay. But now we're back on track, and we have. Um, actually, let me just, I just want to acknowledge that we have um, a public comment line item, but there is nobody here that is um, uh, indicated they want to do any public comment. There's nobody here other than the board. So I um, just want to recognize that. Thank you. All right. So jumping down to new business item number two, since we've covered no number one. Uh, we have visiting today from uh, Explorer Lawrence, Michael Davidson, uh, who wants to share with us uh, some thoughts on storefronts and uh, how we might best uh, take advantage of that opportunity during these. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I guess it's my turn for background. Uh, I'm Michael Davidson. I'm the executive director of Explore Lawrence. I came from the East Coast also. I uh, grew up on Long Island, but actually worked in New York and Connecticut during my, my professional careers. Uh, I am uh, soon to be retiring, so I'll be joining that rank soon, but I just wanted to float some ideas behind you and, and talk some ideas up. I presented this a little bit to the Arch Roundtable where we, uh, we act as uh, the coordinator of that uh, monthly meeting, or actually it's bi-monthly meeting since the pandemic. But uh, I think Porter shared some documents with you. And the first thing was the, the Lawrence Economic Development Strategies and Recommendations. And if you look at goal number two, and this is from the city perspective, as you can see, it's, we create policies, programs, and partnerships that enhance the character and culture of the community. So I love that. And then you go down to strategy one, and it talks about create programs that recover, sustain, and grow the arts community and the arts and entertainment community. So uh, as you've looked at all the articles I shared with you, some of them from communities I actually was involved in. I, I lived in the East End of Long Island for a long period of time. So East uh, Southampton uh, requiring empty storefronts to display art. They actually have a, a, a law that was passed within the village that actually f would fine a landlord if they didn't, uh, didn't feature art. Uh, I think that's a little over the top, but I like the idea of featuring art. Uh, talks about a community in upstate New York that has used their empty storefronts to kind of enhance the downtown. Uh, an interesting article uh, from Atlanta and then one more from New York, which I just came across about actually using storefronts for live art and installations. So as we look at the future of our downtown and the future of downtown generally, uh, they are gonna evolve. Uh, retail and restaurants are gonna be a part, but the downtowns need to become, and I think this is the future of downtowns, and I think we've talked about this in a number of meetings I've participated in, is that for Mass Street to become, still to come, the place to go, and believe it or not, Mass Street before COVID-19 was the number one visited destination in the state of Kansas. And that is not information that we threw out, that's information and that's provided by, by third parties. So Mass Street has always been a place that attract, has attracted visitors. Uh, the future of downtowns is gonna be entertainment. That really is what's gonna happen. Retail is uh, gonna continue to struggle as we become more of an online purchaser. But to keep Mass Street alive, we truly believe that we need to have more entertainment kind of venues down there. The example of, break, of uh, Breakout Lawrence, uh, the axe throwing businesses around for a while, uh, things that Mike Logan is doing in front of his properties with the, the little pop-ups. Those are gonna become sort of, I think, the future of downtown. And we believe that we're an arts community and we are an arts community, but what are we doing to support the arts community? And I think storefront art, storefront installations, storefront entertainment might be a great way for us, not only in the short term, but in the long term to really keep unmistakably Lawrence, Mass Street, the way the place people want to go to. So uh, 
I floated this idea with downtown uh, Lawrence Inc. with the Chamber of Commerce and the Arts Alliance, and everybody thinks that it's a good idea. So the challenge is how do we make it work? Uh, what we have is three players in this. We have the artists, we have the landlord, and we have the city. So in speaking to a number of landlords, and we are we rent space downtown, we have the visitor center in A12 Mass. Uh, so I use my, uh, my landlord as kind of a test. What would it mean? What would encourage you to, to bring art or live entertainment or installation into your storefront? Uh, one of the things uh, that he expressed was that he believes in this and he actually has in some of his spaces actually done some pop-up uh, businesses, business day for a short period of time. There was a, uh, a pop-up in our building before we took it over. Uh, he talked about concerns about liability. Is there some sort of liability that the city can produce that will protect the landlords? Is there some sort of carrots that we can offer to the landlords? Is it, uh, you know, on a monthly basis, you're paying for garbage and, and wastewater and other things like that. And it's a, it's a monthly fee you pay. But if you're not using the building, is that something that could be waived? It's not a huge amount of money, but the idea of creating these kind of partnerships and encouraging it, uh, I think we have enough players in the community working with you know, the art center that we could find artists that would be interested in doing this uh, at our arts round table, uh, Richard Rana, who runs the Buster Festivals there. And he said, I'd, be, I'd love to do something that in a storefront for a period of time. So I think we have the people that are willing to do it, but I think we need to present something to the city as a, as a guidelines or plan. And uh, Marla uh, actually talked about a, a, pot a potential grant that is available from the state of Kansas. And that might be a place for some funding, but we don't want to, as I, as I talked about at the Arts Roundtable, when I was in Washington State, we had tons of tasting rooms in our downtown. We were a wine destination. And the wineries loved local artists to feature our art there. But very few of them ever sold art in that setting. So we also want to find a way to compensate the artists that are going to participate. So we're not looking for you know, a handout. We want to support the local arts industry. So I don't know if this grant that uh, Marla has a toy, I didn't take a, I didn't look at it much today yet. She just pointed out to me, but is that something that the arts commission or the city can go after? And is there some money within the budget of your organization to help fund this kind of effort? So that's the idea I, I want to throw out. Uh, I think there's a lot of people work on it if we can uh, put together a group, but again, obviously, we need to find landlords that are interested. We need to find artists that are interested. We need to figure out if the city can offer, again, either some incentives or help with some of the liability issues that might happen. But I think it, it would be great for our, for our downtown. And I think it could be ex expanded beyond Mass Street. I think it can go to any st storefront that's in the, in the community. So that's the idea I want to pitch to you. I would, I would, as, as I said, I am retiring in a few months, so I'd love to sort of hand this off to to a number of people work on it. And I think you know, your organization, your advisory group could be a cool, should be a point that could help us make this happen. If you guys support it, you push your message up to the to the commissioners, that might help. And again, I am I'm sure that between the Arts Center, downtown uh, Lawrence and Explore Lawrence, we can help kind of find the artists and kind of put together the program. Uh, we do, just to give you a sense of also how we've worked with this organization in the past, uh, early, probably in 2016, maybe to the early, late 16, uh, we came in front of the Cultural Arts Commission and said, we've got Final Fridays here, but nobody's really marketing it to its fullest extent. And we took over the marketing of Final Fridays and created Final Friday's pages on our website. We did some marketing using geofencing. So we were geofencing uh, the art of our art, art events in Kansas City and at Topeka in Manhattan, inviting those people who were interested in the arts to come see what we do. It was, we did a very successful program. Of course, COVID-19 has kind of shut it down. We hope to it gets up and running again. But we do, we have some expertise and our expertise is more in the marketing area but we would appreciate the, the opportunity that 
you might want to take a look on this, support this, and then uh, even when I'm gone, you know, our organization will will be behind this. So just wanted to share that with you. I'll, I'll be free to ask any questions I can. I don't know what this ultimately could look at. I do have the questions and I do have, they think the partners we need to put together and to make this work. So, you know, thank you for an opportunity to let me present and I'll attempt to ask any questions if I can. I will share, this is Marlo. I will share a little bit about the grant that my comment is. Um, it's a state uh, grant from the Creative Arts Industry Commission and it's called Reimagining Spaces. And it's a $10,000 grant and it would require a match. So if it were something where the city could uh, uh, potentially fund half of a project like this, the other half could be applicable for state funding. Um, I can share that link in the chat, Porter, if I'm able to do that, if some people are interested, or I can email it to you and you can send it to the commission. But it, I think it'd be an amazing project for Lawrence. I think especially in pandemic with retail changes and just businesses in different transitions, having those physical spaces being occupied by artists and interesting, you know, ideas and installations is wonderful. Um, I would totally support it. And I think I just find that so illuminating that document that we've talked about before and Michael shared in his presentation about the city strategic plan, putting arts and culture as such an important part of what needs to be marketed. So I think like we do need to put some funding behind those projects. So I think leveraging city funds and state funds, it could really make a big dramatic influence on downtown and just our economy, our creative economy, getting artists and projects who've all been, you know, hit by the pandemic. I think giving them stipends for their work is a great idea because it doesn't have to just be art that's for sale, but it could be installation wise. You know, we've had some really interesting installation art at the art center just in our front window. So I could totally see that being part of it. And I think there's a lot of great opportunity there. This is Mary. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I like the idea of certainly of using the empty storefronts. I would uh, have a question for you though, Michael. Um, how would you extend this beyond Massachusetts Street? Some of us aren't on mass and are doing a lot of work and are promoting visual artists in other facilities. So would you see that as factoring in or would that be something um, totally irrelevant to, to what you're proposing? Well, as you know, you know our organization represents Presents all of all of Lawrence and Douglas County, so I think we could encourage it any place it happens. If there's open space, you know, on the west side, if there's open space in Baldwin or La Compton, I think it would be a great opportunity. So I would I would think we can do it any place. Again, uh, if it's if it's city funds, they might want to say it needs to reside within the, the city limits, but I don't think it should be limited just to uh, just to Mass Street. It's just the most obvious place that we're seeing a good number of open storefronts. But I agree it should be something that we should take out the entire, the entire community. Um, this is Dina. Um, I absolutely love this idea. I feel like it would bring so much um, vibrant energy to, to town. Um, and I, I just wonder if there might be an opportunity to include um, student artwork um, as well as professional artists? How does everyone feel? How do you feel about that? That's yeah, great. At the Art Center, we have that wonderful Hang 12 group. They've done some really interesting yeah. projects. So they seem like they'd be a natural fit as well. So I think, yeah, really having it open to a large variety of groups. I think diversity would be really important to have different types of artists, whether it means media or cultural background, having just a different showcase of artists that would be matched to the venues would be a great idea. I was thinking we could, I mean, you could almost like have it sponsored by one of the, it, I'm just thinking of a storefront thing or whatever, have it sponsored by one of the art institutions in town for like raising awareness in addition to showing, you could see a Van Gogh window on, in somewhere in, on Mass Street or whatever um, that would allow people, maybe who don't get around to the corner down there, 
very much to have some awareness about what's what's going on over there and, and any of the other places, maybe uh, Theater Lawrence, same same thing. Uh, in yoga of the visual art department at KU, the students would welcome an opportunity to exhibit their work. So that might be a really great connection. Yeah, and at the Spencer, we have a, I, I supervise a student advisory board and each year we have a student juried art show and um, it'd be great if we could utilize that space for something like that as well. Um, I feel compelled to speak on this a little bit. Um, I used to be very involved in Charlotte Street Foundation, which actually started this way. Um, there were a lot of empty storefronts in downtown Kansas City, and part of the interest was how do you activate downtown? And so they worked with various um, property owners to develop either static or dynamic um, uh, exhibits and that type of thing. And eventually one of those spaces became the first Charlotte Street Art Gallery for many years. So it was great to see how that evolved. It is a wonderful idea. It's really amazing what can come of this. Um, Michael, you mentioned, I believe, partners like DLI, Arts Alliance, um, landlords in the city. I think you also need some sort of curatorial and project management individual um, because honestly you know it's one thing if i go to the art center and i do an exhibition that's what the art center does so they they're equipped to handle that and help me do that if you go to an empty storefront or an active storefront they don't typically do this and honestly i've seen situations where an artist sort of gets set free in that situation and really doesn't have enough professional experience and it can actually end up being pretty <laughs> unpleasant um, for all parties so I just, my, my thinking is it's a great idea. I think it's something that the Art Commission, you know, should investigate. I think that there are possibilities in perhaps tying it together with um, um, other programs that we're already doing like Outdoor Downtown Sculpture Exhibition. Um, maybe it's a good fit for that, depending on how quickly we want to motivate that because we're still, you know, we're kind of on the hook to do that this year. Um, so I just want to add that, that I do think it's worth thinking this through very carefully and fleshing it out um, to really understand all the different aspects and components because it, it does get tricky. I've actually done it and it can get very complex very quickly, especially when you start working with students and things who, again, may not have real solid exhibition experience. Um, again, great idea, but then suddenly you got a situation where you need 15 pedestals for sculptures and nobody has 15 pedestals for sculptures. Um, so really thinking through all the details. I'm wondering, Porter, if, um, I mean, we, one of the areas where we do have latitude is in our grants. I mean, I'm thinking of a couple years ago, we did the one for the uh, parking spaces downtown where they could be decorated or, or whatever. I mean, we could, in theory, if people applied for our grants in support of, you know, the, the storefront thing, if it were a particular uh, application or whatever, we, we could do that without changing the way we do business a whole lot. So Jerry, this is Marlo. Are you thinking like people would apply for grants, like you would find a storefront, maybe talk to the landlord, and then you'd apply for a grant for your individual project? Is that what you're suggesting? Okay. Yeah, this is Mary. I, I, I guess I want to follow up on what Porter was saying. Um, I think some of you are, are with organizations that, you know, are, are used to displaying art constantly, particularly the Art Center, and you've got people who will help hang the exhibits and have all the materials and all those kinds of things. And what we run into at the theater frequently we require the artists to come in and hang their own shows. And some artists don't have any idea how to do that. Um, they have very specialized requirements 
And as a, a theater producer, we sometimes find it difficult to meet some of the requirements that they've got. So I think as we go into this, we need to keep in mind what what Porter's talking about in, in terms of what kind of physical or um, technical support we would be um, willing or obligated to give these folks. So I wonder, um, just like from an action standpoint, um, Michael, if, I mean, it sounds to me like you, you, you all are taking the lead on this. I mean, would it be helpful? And, and it sounds to me like everyone is, is in support of it. It sounds uh, to me, would it be helpful for us to maybe identify a volunteer or to, uh, to liaise with you all from, from our group as, as you develop this? Sounds okay. good. Any volunteers? Marlo, I see a hand. Dina, okay, great. Anyone else? Marlo, I had an idea. Um, I've loved what Porter was talking about, and I didn't know you were involved with that Charlotte Street project, but would you be, because you have such a wealth of knowledge, would you be interested or maybe get us somebody from Charlotte Street that we could talk to and maybe think about like all those issues that you brought up because honestly my mind didn't even go there till you mentioned it. I'm like oh yeah that's so obvious so I think using your breadth of knowledge and experience in that area would be really valuable yeah I think you know I can't commit too much I'm spread mighty thin um but if you have a meeting and, and get to a point where you sort of develop some ideas I can come in and help think through some of those logistical issues and details and some of this is sort of cart and horse um, you know, to Jerry's point, if an artist says, I want to write a grant for X amount of dollars to put art in the empty storefront at wherever or install it at Theater Lawrence or, or whatever, and that artist is capable of working with Mary and her group to make sure that they can do that effectively and so everybody's happy with it, that's great. Um, but, you know, these there's times where I've seen where artists get involved and it becomes something of a shotgun marriage situation where everybody's like, this sounds great and everybody's enthused. But then when you actually come to the actual implementation, people just don't understand, you know, you're, you're coming from two different worlds and it can really be um, unpleasant. So sorry, more than you needed. I would be happy to help. Ironically, Charlotte Street, I think, has evolved so much that they, I don't know that there's any anybody there that has a real memory of when they used to do this stuff. This was a long time ago. I wasn't even gray haired, I don't think. All right. Anything else on that before we move on uh, deeper in the agenda? All right. Nice discussion. Thanks for bringing that to us, Michael. Um, um, Mr. Chair, I just want to. Um, so Michael happened to be here for this presentation and we're talking about the TGT grant program and Michael, of course, um, has been helping with that program and is, is involved in the TGT funding. So if it's okay with you and the commission, Michael asked if he could stay and I think that's fine and he might have some good, good input for us too. Oh, I think I've, he, he's been here so much. I think I've called him in the roll call before. <laughs> All right. I can see you laughing. I can't hear because everyone's on mute, but. Uh, all right, so yeah, uh, D3 is, uh, we did our elections in our, um, in our uh, retreat. However, we held back on this one um, because I think Mary was not uh, able to be with us and we wanted to uh, hold off on doing that uh, pending, getting your thoughts about continuing in that capacity. Uh, this is an area that I'm really interested in, and I would be happy to continue. Do we have to vote uh, on this, Porter? Uh, if Mary's the only person interested, then I think it's more of a consensus um, kind of agreement that nobody's really 
vehemently opposed, but if somebody else is interested, then they should speak up too. I think, jo I, go ahead, Denise, go ahead, I'm sorry. What's involved in being a TGT grant advisory board liaison? Mary, do you want to speak to that or would you like me to? Why don't you go ahead? Um, so the TGT grant program is coming up, I believe, on its sixth year in 2021. The city has allocated $120,000 from the TGT fund for the grant program. We implement the grant program in the fall um, for the following years. So we did the TGT grant program this past fall. Uh, the TGT board meets and, and we need to start coordinating meetings to talk about, you know, reviewing their current criteria and determining how they want to proceed and if everything is aligned. And then the, the major effort is um, probably starts late summer where we start scheduling meetings and um, developing the RFQ for the grant program and then working through um, what three, three, well, there's a meeting potentially two meetings, depending on how many people apply, where we allow grant applicants to present for three minutes each. Um, and then after that, there's um, another meeting to start the review process. And ultimately, uh, Mary and the other board members um, reviewed all of the grant applications and developed their, um, through, their through the criteria process, developed their list of um, um, scoring, and then we actually deliberate and determine who is going to be the awarded grants. So I would say six meetings, um, which are more intense come fall and winter. And our member is a voting member, correct? Our liaison is a voting member? Yes, we have um, uh, two people that represent the arts and culture realm on the TGT grant program because it is twofold and Michael can speak to this too. As you all probably know, TGT funding comes from hotel stays. So every time somebody stays in a hotel here, they pay 6% to that bill um, that is dedicated to the TGT fund. So that's where that money comes from. Um, and then um, um, what was I, I? I totally lost my train of thought. Sorry. Jerry, say again what you're asking. Uh I, I was asking about whether whether we vote, uh, whether our person. Yes, has a sorry. Vote. So part of it is representing the hoteliers, and there are several hotel positions. Um, but then part of it is also the arts and culture side. And Mary did that this past year, along with Sue Shea from the Phoenix Gallery. All right. Uh, any other questions about that? Um, you know, Jerry, it'd probably be easier since it is a, uh, an, you know, a, a position appointed by the Art Commission, probably go through and, and go ahead and get a, um, uh, get a, a motion second and a vote. All right, can I have a motion to uh, nominate Mary for our TGT representative? Let's approve it, Mary. Second? Right. I'll second, Christina. Christina, second. All in favor? Aye. And let the record show that everybody raised their hand affirmatively. Yes. Unanimous. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for being willing to do that. I'm uh, guarding you all from the basketball people that Michael keeps bringing in. <laughs> <laughs> stay strong Mary stay strong with that um, yeah there's some other there's some other issues Joshua's not here tonight but there's some other things about about that that we can keep track of as we as we go through this year um, I don't know if we need to say anything else beyond what we said about it at the at the uh, at the retreat but um, so we'll be well, if I could ask one thing what you're doing is actually making a recommendation to the city commission on funding. Is they are the if they are the they will approve it or not. You not you know the group makes recommendations. So I just want to make people understand that, and they have never not 
take in the slate of recommendations, but they do have the authority to decide to fund or not fund. Right. Yeah. So I guess when I say a voting member, I mean voting for the for the recommendation to uh, to fund. Yeah. Right. That's thanks, yeah. That's thanks true. for making that distinction. Sometimes we forget that when we're when you know. We, we give ourselves more power up here than, uh, than what we actually have. Uh, voting on a recommendation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have the Kansas Open Meetings Act next. It's always a good uh, reminder, such a, an interesting presentation. Yeah, since we um, are getting started for the new year and we have several um, new members, I wanted to go through this. Um, is, it so. is it tailored? Um, while you're doing that, I'll distract you, Porter. Is it tailored for, you know, these unusual times? Um, or uh, I suppose you can probably speak to that as, as you go through, since, since our meetings, our open meetings, are now virtual and probably will be for some amount of time. I'm yeah. sure there's some, there's some tailoring or differences uh, in the way that we do our meetings. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how this applies to that. Um, I'm tempted. Can you see? So you're seeing the Kansas Open Meetings Act yes. now? Okay. Let me um, hang on. Sorry. It's always a pain because the menu for Zoom overlaps the top of the. Uh, there we go. I can move that. Um, you got me thinking. So first and foremost, you know, I, I'm sure you all have seen this. Can you see the agenda now? Okay. So to Jerry's point, basically, you know, what the city has done during the pandemic is altered our typical in-person meetings into virtual meetings, as you well know. Um, to do that, we made adaptations, but basically kept everything as consistent as possible. So uh, one thing is I'm sitting here in the city commission room. If somebody doesn't have technology access, they can come here and, and view the meeting with you all. Um, we also have options to, to view the meeting in the, um, in the lobby if necessary. So if anybody needs access, we make sure we provide that. And that's part of Kansas Open Meetings Act is making sure anybody can come and visit the meeting. Um, as you see here, we're also live streaming um, through YouTube right now, so people can view the meeting that way. And of course, as you know, you can always register and anybody can register for the meeting. Um, so that's the primary thing. We actually do have a policy um, that if you're interested is here. Uh, let me get to the, so this is the iCompass page. This is our third party platform for all things related to board and commission meetings. And if you go here, you can see some information about all this. Um, including various policies and things for what the city is doing currently. I won't belabor that. So to answer your question, we have adapted. We've made sure that we are aligned with COMA, even under these conditions, um, and are, are you know, fulfilling all of our COMA agreements and, and transparency and all that. Great. Thanks. Um, so now let me see if I can get back to... Sorry, jumping around here. Okay, so the Kansas Open Meetings Act or COMA. And I just wanna, the other thing that's important is I'm gonna go through this presentation quickly. Um, you also received a document um, regarding uh, current things with the Attorney General related to social media, because that is now becoming a factor as people are actually, um, somebody got called out because they were communicating via social media inadvertently but with more than the allotted reasonable members of the board and that is effectively doing board work outside of a board meeting so you really have to be mindful about you know communicating and that type of thing that said if, if a committee meets to talk about storefront art there's no problem there um, because you, you're tasked with that um, effort but if you start doing art commission business during that meeting and there's three or more of you then that can be problematic so let me go through this. And of course, there we go. Okay, so open meetings principle. The open meetings principle is based on the belief that the people have a right to know the public business. 
and information is essential to the effective functioning of our democratic process. Purpose of COMA in recognition of the fact that a representative government is dependent upon informed electorate, it is declared to be the policy of the state that meetings for the conduct of governmental affairs and the transaction of governmental business be open to the public. That's what I just was referencing. COMA applies when the body involved is a covered entity and there is a meeting. Bodies that are subject to the act, it applies to all legislative and administrative bodies, state agencies and political and taxing sub subdivisions, including city advisory boards and commissions, which receive or expend and are supported in whole or in part by public funds. Three conditions must be met for a meeting to occur. All three must be present. A gathering of a majority of the members of the body, interactive communication in person by telephone or any other medium, say Zoom, um, discussion of the business or affairs of the body. Majority of the membership, so for the 11 member Lawrence Cultural Arts Commission, a majority of the membership is six. So if you're gathered at the Art Center and there's five of you, you're fine, but if there's six, be, be mindful. Just don't talk about business is really the point with that. Um, interactive communication, act applies when there's interactive communication. Clearly applies when members are in physical presence of, of one another. Uh, telephone calls, including conference calls, work sessions, staff briefings, video conferencing, online communications, when there is the opportunity for contemporaneous interaction. And that, of course, includes social media. Discussing the business of the body. Discussion of public business is what triggers the application of COMA. A vote or binding action is not necessary for COMA to apply. So this is any kind of business, regardless of whether you're voting on something. Social gatherings are not subject to coma if there is no discussion of business of the body. That's what I was referencing. If you're all gathered at the art center for an event, there's no problem in that. Conferences may be attended by board members where items of general interest are discussed as long as specific business of the body is not discussed by a majority of the Lawrence Cultural Arts Commission. Electronic communications. The attorney general has indicated that the mere fact that a communication is electronic does not raise a coma issue. If a majority of the body uses an electronic communication to engage in interactive discussions, such contact may raise a coma issue. That's one reason that we prefer that you not respond to all in emails, um, that you go through me when you want to communicate with the, the board. Um, if a majority of the body uses an electric communication to engage in, uh, oh, sorry, a single email sent to other members would likely not be considered a violation but participation in an online chat room or instant messaging may be considered a violation of coma because of its interactive nature. Um, emails, avoid initiating an on, online discussion with fellow advisory boards members through email. You may receive emails about a city matter in which other advisory board members are also sent or copied on the email, but avoid the reply all function. Uh, serial meetings, a series of interactive communications of less than a majority is not permitted under coma. A violation of coma may occur if the communications collectively, collectively involve a majority of the membership of the body, share a common topic of discussion concerning business or affairs of the body, and are intended by any or all of the participants to reach agreement on a matter that would require, would require binding action to be taken by the body or agency. Coma apply, this is a review, coma applies when the body involved is a covered entity and there is a meeting. Majority of the members of the body, interactive communication and members discuss the business of the body. Coma requirements, all meetings of entities covered by coma must be open to the public and proper notice must be given. Meetings are open to the public and accessible to the general public. Meetings must be conducted so the public may observe or listen to the proceedings. Notice of the date, time, and place of any regular special meeting must be given to any person requesting such notice. COMA does not require notice to be given with any, within any particular time frame. Um, notice first must be requested before a body is required to provide it. Agendas, COMA does not require an agenda be created. 
If a body creates one, it should include the topics planned for discussion. Agendas can be amended. If agendas exist, copies must be available to those who request them. Executive sessions. Meetings closed to the public called executive sessions are permitted in limited circumstances. City advisory boards should not have an executive session without the prior approval of the city attorney's office. Certain procedures must be followed and only certain topics may be discussed during an executive session. Typically, this relates to personnel issues, which I don't believe this board would have a, a reason for that that I can think of at this time. Uh, possible ramifications for violation of coma requirements. The attorney general or the district attorney investigates potential coma violations. The attorney general has stated that his office sees compliance with the act and his office wants to assure future violations do not occur. They may require the body to receive additional coma training. Uh, 2015 changes to the act provide the attorney general with new enforcement authority and creates an open government fund. The attorney general can determine by preponderance of the evidence coma violations. If violations are found, the attorney general can enter into a consent order with public agency and may apply to, dis to district court to enforce a consent order. The consent order may impose civil penalties of up to $250 per violation, require training. District court action may impose court costs, investigative and attorney fees if the attorney general must enforce compliance through district court. The attorney general may also enter into a consent judgment with the violator, which may contain any remedy available to the court, um, could be invalidation of actions and or removal of office, ouster or recall. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. And I know our city attorney's office um, would be happy to answer questions on this too. So we appreciate you guys um, understanding this and going through this. And as I said, the documents that I attach, you can review those two related to the social media information. All right. Any questions on that? You don't want that $250 fine for sure. Um, all right, next on the agenda is the strategic plan presentation. And Porter, so um, let me do a little bit of an introduction on this. Um, as we know, there are various plans in place like the cultural plan, the comprehensive plan. So the city has a variety of plans. Um, our new city manager is very interested in being much more um, purposeful in um, our efforts as a city. So you're seeing that with the economic development strategic plan um, that is underway um, and various other plans. And part of this is actually the strategic plan as well. And so as we are working, I wanna make sure that you have some sense of understanding as this strategic plan is unfolding. Um, last night, the city commission got a presentation on where the strategic plan is currently, which is somewhere around the midway point um, and I'm thinking that most of you probably maybe not have heard anything about this. So I think it's a really good opportunity to quickly go through this just to give you a sense of what is occurring and how the city's beginning to look at how it can align its efforts, um, again, more purposefully directed to what, what we all agree on as what is the city doing. So with that, let me share my screen again and to go through the strategic plan. So the strategic plan boils down to three main things, why we do what we do, what it takes to achieve the future that we have described, and our commitments to how we do that work, which ensures that we do it right and with excellence. The strategic plan comprises five components, vision, mission, values, outcomes, and commitments. The vision of the strategic plan in the city is the city of Lawrence supporting an unmistakably vibrant community with innovative, equitable, transparent, and responsible local government. The mission is we create a community where all enjoy life and feel at home. Our values are character, competence, courage, collaboration, and commitment. So sort of the core of this strategic plan are five outcomes. 
Um, and each of these outcomes has a staff representative that is called a champion for this particular outcome. Uh, the first one is unmistakable identity. Lawrence is a welcoming community synonymous with arts, diverse culture, fun, and a quintessential downtown. City parks and community events contribute to the vibrancy experienced by all people in Lawrence. Uh, strong, welcoming neighborhoods is led up by Jeff Crick, who's the planning and development director. Uh, unmistakable identity is being led up by Derek Rogers. And Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, are you, have you been involved in the unmistakable identity? Yes, sir. I've attended uh, most of those meetings. So Derek has expanded beyond just city staff, and I believe Margaret Morris has been involved. Has anybody, any of you been involved? Yeah, I've been on them. Okay, so Mary's been involved in that too. Um, safe and Secure, which is being led by our fire chief, Sean Coffey. I won't read all these. You're welcome to, and this is on the agenda, so you can look at these. Um, prosperity and Economic Security. Uh, Britt Cromcano works in the city manager's office and handles um, development. And then Infrastructure, Asset Management, and Connectivity, which is Dave Wagner, which is, um, he's the Director of Municipal Services and Operations. And then we have six commitments. Um, one is community engagement, and I'm overseeing that commitment. Let me read through that because I think it's important. Listen, share, and engage with our community to drive action and build trust in city government. We invite and welcome all community members to collaborate and innovate with us. Through strong and equitable engagement with our community, we share and receive information about important city services and community life. So we're actually developing a couple of things. We're developing an internal um, community engagement sort of a core plan and then a broader plan for various community engagement efforts. This ranges from everything from street construction or development projects or right now 27th Street and the Mutt Run situation, um, trying to work on ways to actually engage the community in a, in a more sort of conscientious and proactive way um, so that we don't end up with such quite a struggle when we get to a city commission meeting that, that people are, are more understanding about what's happening. Um, efficient and effective processes, Michael Aldridge, who is the director of um, the current interim director of the IT department. Equity inclusion, most of you know that Ferris Muhammad was, was hired back in, and started in November, um, and he's focused on equity and inclusion. Sound fiscal stewardship is Jeremy Wilmoth, who is our finance director. Engaged and empowered teams is Lori Carnahan. That's sort of the internal um, part of working with staff and the, the human resources aspect. Lori is head of human resources. And environmental sustainability, Jasmine Moore is the um, sustainability director. She works for both the city and the county um, and will oversee that. And then we're in the process of developing what are called key performance indicators. So basically for each of these core outcomes, these teams are developing um, KPIs, which are key performance indicators, what kind of measures will help us determine if we are actually achieving what we have set out to achieve, basically. Um, so we're working on that data and the, the city commission reviewed um, some of those initial KPIs uh, last night. So those are available on that agenda if you wanna look at it. Basically, these will help us measure our progress in the five outcome and six commitment areas and guide our efforts into the future. And uh, uh, this is the community engagement piece. So that was the primary thing. So I wanted to give you that overview. We do have a web page um, dedicated to the strategic plan and that's through the city's um, website. And so you can find that there as well. I just want you to be cognizant of that because we're talking about the cultural plan, which is great. We're talking about the economic development strategic plan, also great. And then this is unfolding as well. So. Um, a fairly significant sort of shift in how we plan to do business going forward in the future. Um, this is Mary. I've got a kind of a, a question. Um, I, I'm really excited to see the arts and culture featuring relatively prominently in both the city strategic plan and then in the Oh, did my, yeah, Michael's still here. And then in the in the piece that Michael shared, the economic development plan, and and I guess I, I would like a little better understanding of how these 
different groups are going to come together to, to help make all this happen. It seems like there are lots of committees, some of whom I'm part of, and I'm, I, I guess I, I'm unclear on how eventually they're all going to coalesce. Um, and, and I would dare say that, um, hopefully I'm not putting words in the city manager's mouth, but I think that he would agree <laughs> um, that this is, you know, he, he usually opens meetings saying this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. Um, he's, it's based on sort of a, a different scorecard like methodology. The general idea of, is, of this is really to, you know, right now, um, with no disrespect to anybody, but ideas come to our boards, ideas come to the city commission, and they all tend to be sort of shiny objects that can be distracting. How do we get to a place where we really all agree, this is how we want to move forward, this is how we're going to align our resources, and this is how we're going to proceed and measure how we proceed in these areas. Um, and you know, with that is also the budget. It will help the city commission determine how they want to spend their funds. You know, if, if we say, okay, our roads are really bad, we need to raise our roads, and the city commission say, okay, we can do that, it's going to cost X amount of dollars over this period of time, is that the, re the investment and resources and money that we want to give, or do we want to bring it back because we have challenges related to some other issue? Does that make sense? So it really is trying to look at the entire picture. Right. Um, I, I guess... So I guess, Porter, my question is, uh, we've got this planning process and we've got the economic development planning process and we have the cultural plan. And does the economic development process, it, is that being used as a tool to support the strategic plan or is that completely different? And maybe Michael has some input on there. I, I, that that's where I I understand completely what you're saying, and I agree with it completely, and and uh, see how it can be very beneficial. What I'm unclear about is how the various plans relate to each other. I'm not sure I have much insight to give you on that, Mary. I I, I think I still feel the same same thing you feel. There's a lot of plans but I don't know how they get from the paper to the action. And that's why I, I kind of brought the economic uh, strategic plan to you saying that it seemed like something the city was gonna want to support. And I thought the idea of coming up with an idea to the city makes sense. But again, you've been around for a long time. There's been a lot of these plans written. I know that at one point, uh, the cultural chats we were, we were doing always sort of came back to the master plan for the arts community. And again, it's a very well written document, but how do we take it from that to action? And I think that's gonna be, I think that's Craig's big challenge, but I, but I agree, it, I'm still a little fuzzy on it also. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Mary, I, I don't think I can give you a definitive answer because I'm still learning as well. But I do want to point out, if you look at the five outcomes, one of them is prosperity and economic security, led by Britt Crumcano, who is also leading the effort to do the um, economic development strategic plan. So that's where those two things start to tie together. And then they are trying to balance with all of these other outcomes and then these six, commit, six commitments are also influencing all of that as well. How that works mechanically, I don't, I don't know that anybody fully knows at this point. Um, so we're still in that evolutionary sort of um, learning curve. So I apologize, I wish I could give you a more distinct answer, but that's the, the intention. One thing I will say, and I really appreciate this from Craig, he doesn't want this to be one of those plans that gets done and then sits on a shelf or ends up in a frame on the wall. He really is making an effort, and I really appreciate this, to change our culture. Um, and coincidentally, we started this pre-pandemic, but since the pandemic and George Floyd and so many other things, I think the time really is ripe for us in city government to, to earnestly look at how are we doing what we're doing? Are we really doing everything we need to do. I mean, hiring a director of equity and inclusion is a, is a great first step, 
Um, and Ferris is, you know, bless his heart, he started his job during the pandemic. I think I've only seen him in human form once. Um, I see him on, you know, video all the time. Not an easy way to start a job. Um, so, sorry, I can't give you a lot of insight, but I hope that gives you some. And mostly I want you to be aware of it as we, you know, this is, is happening. Um, so just to make sure you all are aware of it. I would dare say too, coincidentally, some of the things I'm seeing showing up in these efforts uh, actually seem to be almost drawn from the cultural plan. So I will say that that cultural plan was infused into a lot of other things like the downtown master plan, the comprehensive plan also speaks to arts and culture. So, you know, that's the good news is maybe the cultural plan didn't um, function as the tool that we thought it might, but it certainly has been influential in speaking to some of the issues in city um, government and um, informing some of those other plans. And maybe that's a good segue. Yeah, because that is our, our next topic. Oh, hang on, let me find. I seem to recall from our retreat that, that maybe we had committed to taking a bite bite size view of this at each of the meetings and I don't know. That's what I'm remembering anyway. Because when you open this this thing up, it's like a. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree. I don't. I don't think we want to dive into this too deeply. But for some that haven't seen it, perhaps it's a good thing to be aware of. It is available on our um, website too, so people can go into this. And I can share the the PDF is also available, and this is in the back of the PDF. So let me just share this quickly. Um, so what you have is a multi-page document that is basically set up. If you can see my cursor down here, it says A1, balance the local. This matrix is built on the, so going way back, um, just before I was hired, the city um, engaged a consultant team that worked really diligently to do a lot of really strong community engagement to really glean a good perspective on arts and culture in Lawrence. And this has never been done before to develop this cultural plan. Um, like I said, there was a lot of uh, meetings in this and they developed um, one, whoops, where the heck did it go? Hang on, sorry, things jump here. Where did it go? Sorry, that was weird. It just disappeared. Yeah, is it the Excel spreadsheet at the bottom? Oh, thank you. I was thinking, okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, this is one of those things where these menus do not cooperate together. Yeah, we can see two instances of it at the bottom, but you probably can't see that. Okay. There we are you seeing just the one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, hang on, how do I shrink this down? I'd love to do this in person. Okay, so um, first and foremost, came up with a vision statement. Lawrence is, a nationally recognized, is nationally recognized for its collaborative spirit that boldly propels the community to reach its potential through a focus on creativity and the greater good. Um, and then through that, they develop these different goal areas, balance the local, embrace all, build places together, build a creative brand, promote lifelong learning, and it goes on through, I think, at least five or six other um, layer B down here. Maybe it's just the one, sorry. Um, so just to give you an overview, that's what this is now. And each of these includes 
you can see the community outcomes. The goal is embrace all, which is strive for cultural equity. Um, you know, this was ahead of its time and a healthier community through greater collaboration across all sectors. Whoops. Um, for the greater good to reach its potential. Sorry, this thing is jumping all over the place. Reach its potential through a focus on creativity. <laughs> um, through a focus on creativity for the greater good. And then each one has goal, embrace all, and then there's certain actions. Adjust language in all city communications to be sensitive to culture and gender diversity, to equitably treat a broad range of traditions and forms of expression, identify gaps in cultural equality, and provide ongoing feedback mechanisms and outreach for moving in, in the equity needle. So, you know, this really spoke to a lot of issues that are still very current, obviously more current in a way than they were even back then. Um, and that's just one aspect, build places together is more of the development and um, infrastructure side of things. Build a creative brand. This kind of gets into Michael's world of the unmistakable brand and our uniqueness. And um, the fact that we do have such a strong arts and culture heritage and um, presence. And then um, promote lifelong learning, working with, with people um, through all, all stages of life and that type of thing. So I'm not sure what we want to do at this point with this, but that gives you a good overview of it. Well, th thanks for thanks for doing that, Porter. I I had a comment and and a question for for us. I I guess the comment is when when I think of how we apply this document, the low hanging fruit is that you know in our grant scoring and and awards and so forth. We, we require that, um, that proposals, grant proposals, uh, talk to each of these issues. So, so we, you know, we, um, we in fact, you know, in, in order to, to get the award of a, of a grant from this group, you have to demonstrate that your project, you know, is, is in alignment with this. And, and that's great. Um, my question to the group is, is, is if, if that's the only nod to it, if that's the only way that we, that we do it, I mean, maybe that's enough, I don't know, but how, how, can, we, how can we further, um, what, what other actions can we do to, uh, you know, so that our efforts promote the, the cultural plan? So correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears like this document is set up so that, you know, there's different goals that are outlined and there's, you know, obviously lots of blank spaces as, as to who is going to be involved in, in, in leading the push towards those goals and making those things happen. So, I mean, is it possible that this, that, uh, that's where, um, you know, as far as the, uh, the responsibilities for making some of those things happen could fall upon this committee? Well, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, you know, I don't know if, if we want to uh, divide the group in, into, you know, sort of uh, people being responsible for certain tabs, at least the aspect of it. I mean, this is a citywide thing. And so the name, uh, but, but then the question is, you know, what, what's our part in that? And so um, I, I'm not against the idea of, of folks you know, wanting to, I mean, if you have a, if, if a particular tab, if you will, is a passion area of yours, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I think that, that'd be, that's a good discussion. Um, I know that we talked about um, making sure that this is on our, our agenda or some portion of it, whether it was one of those tabs, you know, on a rolling basis that we that we talked about in each each of our meetings um anyway i asked it, it was a bit of a provocative question i asked just to to get some discussion around that because it's you know it's easy to say well our our in order to get the grant you've got to demonstrate that you you're 
your project does this, but but on a more proactive basis, what can the group do? And and I think if people had a passion, uh, as Daniel was suggesting, to sort of um, promote one of those tabs, or an, an, if it was an area that 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 you had passion for, uh, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, Jerry, this is Mary. Let let me just maybe because I'm so old. Let me provide a little maybe historic um, perspective here. Uh, Josh and I were both on the committee to formulate the um, cultural plan. And it was at the same time that we were putting together job descriptions and doing a, a search for the um, uh, director of arts and culture for Lawrence. And uh, in, in looking at this today, Actually, one of the things that struck me was how far we've come, which was a very pleasant surprise. Because in, in looking at this plan and looking at um, remembering a little bit of, of the um, um, atmosphere in, in the city at that time, to, to, to look at the plan and then juxtapose it with what we're seeing coming out of the economic development plan, recognizing the importance of arts and culture and looking at the city strategic plan, noting the importance of arts and culture. I, I'm very, very, very much heartened by uh, the strides that have been made. And I think much of that has been due to um, to Porter being in, even though he's been hobbled in the position that he's he's come to be in, and also Michael's commitment to to fostering the arts in Lawrence, and so I, I guess I'm pleasantly surprised. Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree. Do we need to Porter remind us? Is there how this thing is uh, a little long in the tooth? Uh, as far as its age, do we need to uh, watch that, Jerry? <laughs> no, I didn't say a person. The the, the document. Um, do we? It, are, do we need to? You know, think about updating it, or what? Uh, what are your thoughts on on that? Uh, I think it's a great question. Um, I I like Mary and pleasantly. You know, I was knee deep in this for a long time and then I haven't really looked at it intently for a long time and, and dug back into it and not just the matrix but the whole plan it really is a terrific plan and the fact that it still remains timely is is also great you know and, and plans usually have a three to five year lifespan so um so I think you know if we saw a grant and we thought this might be something we'd be interested in that would be uh worth considering you know, one thing I think every board, and remember, there's like 40 boards and commissions in the city doing a variety of things, um, is also to keep one's feet on the ground. And what I mean by that is that if you think about it, you all have agreed to meet 12 times this year um, on every second Wednesday and conduct your business. Any other stuff you'd have to do on your own time. If you do culture chat, if you meet as a committee to talk about storefront art, et cetera, et cetera, all great stuff. Um, but, you know, resources and bandwidth is not endless, as we all know. Um, and we have other things in our lives that we're doing. So a big thing that I think is always important to keep in mind is, is what is really practical um, are we looking at a short-term situation, a midterm situation, or a long-term situation? A great lesson from this cultural plan was I think it was a worthy effort. And like Mary said, I think it's actually infused itself in many ways into the city's consciousness um, without seemingly without a heck of a lot of direct effort per se. It did hire a director of arts and culture. It did allow bigger conversations in this arena. Um, you know, Michael came in and immediately engaged with the arts community. So um, that's a good thing. So that's, you know, more of a longer term thing. So, um, you know, where we want to go with that is another question. And I think that's something that, that you all need to, 
think through and, and start, you know, thinking on those shorter and longer term goals. Maybe as we, as we, uh, over the next few months, as we, you know, open it up and look at a tab or two and discuss that or whatever, we can note things that have been successful to Mary's point, And then maybe things that, that, for whatever reasons have changed or, or that we should consider um, changing as we, as we go through it. Any other thoughts or ideas on the cultural, cult, cultural plan? You guys know when I get late in these meetings, I can't pronounce that word anymore. This is Marlo. I would echo what Mary and Porter said about it being successful. I feel like to me, the most meaningful thing during the pandemic has been the round table. And I saw somewhere on that plan where it talked about collaboration and getting different groups to work together. And I really feel like that group meeting biweekly virtually has really helped everybody as a whole. So it's not only like anytime there's a problem, like when we first started figuring out virtual events, everybody kind of got around that table and said, this is how I've done it. This is how I've done it. Here's an idea. And it really helped. And I think to me, that's maybe the hugest thing to come out of that plan is those collaborations. Um, Cause I think, you know, having that entity and that regularity of those meetings to fall back on when you have a crisis, like a pandemic, it was really important. Great. Anybody else? All right. We want to take a look. We moved to old business. Do we want to take a look at the budget? Porter, we submitted, oh, you're on mute if you were saying anything. I just said some really good stuff, too. I was trying to take <laughs> notes, but I couldn't read your lips. <laughs> Sorry, this menu, you should, if, you, if only you could be here and see these screens doing this to me, it's like every time I open something, something jumps, and it's like, where did it go? Okay. So um, this is the current year's budget, which is the Outdoor Downtown Sculpture Exhibition, the Community Arts Grants, the Phoenix Awards, and then there's a miscellaneous um, item for $49,000, which is the current budget. Um, and then this just shows, I just happen to have this. So this is the TGT um, sales tax information, and it just shows how the TGT funding, and this does not account for um, this is thinking that this is what's going to happen, and then eventually it'll come back after the pandemic. Um, so this is actually, Michael, this was back from our fall presentation. So it's not current right now, so don't take it literally, but it gives you an idea of what we've been looking at with the TGT funding. Um, this is the tourism fund budget and all the different things that are funded through that um, program, which is, includes the cultural marketing plan, the art commission. So this is something that's been held we have not used it, um, and obviously last year funds were so tight, and Michael knows it, that even um, Explore Lawrence was down by half in their annual budget. But there is funding there to do some cultural marketing as well, so um, for your awareness. And then, um, again, these are the budget allocations. So eventually, and coming up actually, actually rather quickly, will be another budget cycle where you all will submit a, um, an agenda item to the city commission requesting your allocations. Given circumstances, I wouldn't imagine that things would be likely to change significantly. Two years ago, you actually asked for an increase in the in community arts grants. Um, I think you asked for $45,000 and the commission did not do that. They kept it static at $25,000. And as Michael pointed out, the TGT grant fund is also a grant program through that fund for now $120,000, which is $30,000 less than what it has been the past several years. Um, so I just want to bring this into your awareness. And as we've discussed, 
um, you know, once these are allocated, you don't necessarily have to implement the program exactly the same way as it's been done. And we started to talk about that with the outdoor downtown sculpture exhibition and allocating, I think, about half of those opportunities for more sort of innovative type public art interventions, which coincidentally could also fall in the realm of storefronts potentially. Um, so, you know, it's that kind of thing of trying to encourage artists to think outside the box and give them money to experiment and, and develop new ideas. Yeah, I, I liked that idea. That was a great discussion uh, in our, in our um, uh, retreat. Um, as I recall, we, where we left it was we, we, we would proceed as if we were going to uh, going to be able to use this as, as we plan. Um, is there any reason to think? I mean, I don't know. At what point do we? At what point do we know? No, we can't do the outdoor sculpture. No, we can't do the grants. You know, no, we can't award the Phoenix. Uh, uh, you know, award design or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a direct answer. So much depends on what happens with the pandemic. You know, we are getting the vaccines out and that type of thing, but we are seeing new strains. Um, yeah. If we end up doing another shutdown, Michael, you have, might might have some insights on what what's happening in the hotel world. It seems like we've reached some level of sort of, for lack of better, status quo, and people are. It's not nearly what it was, but people are staying in hotels and maybe you can shed some light on that. Uh, well, for 2020, we saw a 45% decrease in hotel room revenue. And that's just the room sales. That's not, you know, if there was a restaurant or other amenities that the hotel offered. So that, that number, you know, has decreased basically in half what we expect to get from the transient guest tax dollars. Now, uh, for the first time in a very long time, we get a weekly travel sentiment study that's done by an organization. And for the first time in eight months, there's now people are thinking they're gonna travel within the next six months. And it's directly related to the vaccine. Now that's good for on a national level. On the Lawrence level, uh, we're really driven by sports and this youth sports market is, is coming back and it's really one of the few segments that hasn't suffered during this period of time. But uh, restrictions within the Douglas County have not allowed us to host those events. So the hotels are not seeing that revenue which sustains us, it really is, you know, it's volleyball, it's basketball, it's softball, baseball during the summer that basically, you know, fill our hotels 30 months out of the year. So you bring in a big basketball tournament and will fill our hotel rooms. Uh, additionally, you know, the lack of a football season and the restriction on the number of people allowed to go to our own field house to watch a basketball game has really depressed our market. So until those things come back, I'm not seeing us returning to 2019 levels, probably to 2022. Because again, two, two major market segments aren't coming back. Meetings and conventions are not coming back. They're just not. The Zoom is as much as it's been a great benefit to allow us to hold meetings. It has basically associated the saying, why go through the hassle of having a a big meeting in a, in, a, in, a, in a city or a small place like Lawrence, with all the expenses we could do a Zoom and it's half the price or less. So we don't think that markets are going to go back for a while. So I am not incredibly optimistic that the transient desk tax is going to produce the revenue that we need to do the things we want to do. And, and beyond uh, funding Explore Lawrence and funding <clears throat> the cultural arts program, it funds a lot of things that people aren't even aware of in this town. It funds the downtown lighting program. It funds the banner program. It funds uh, downtown Lawrence. It funds some funds for the Watkins Museum. So a lot of things have been coming out of that, that fund for a lot of years because it had generated a lot of money. 
So there's going to be tough decisions the city's going to have to make. I know that every quarter, Jeremy has to talk to the 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 state of the finances of the uh, of the city, and that's going to be sales tax, and that's going to be transient guest tax, and it could be halfway through the year he's going to say, "Hey, we're not going to get anywhere near the million dollars we expected. We're going to have to make some cuts." Now, last year, the the programs that suffered the largest cuts was the uh, Explore Lawrence and the Transient Guest Tax Grant Program. I think almost everything else was funded to its to its full amount, but those two so those two places were funded. You know, basically part of part of the, the transient guest tax was the the programs didn't happen, so that's why the money wasn't expended. But I think if those events might have occurred, they might even cut back because again, when our funds were cut by 50%, I think the city was looking at other places to save money. So again, the transient guest tax ran in a great deficit this year. And it's going to run into deficit next year unless the city makes adjustments. Right, but I mean, our our, our we, didn't, we didn't have any funds to to uh, to work with. Yeah, your forty nine thousand dollars comes out of the transient guest tax. It does. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, hang on, I want to I want to clarify, but that money wasn't spent last year. Um, we did no. not implement. Um, we didn't do the community arts grants. We didn't do the outdoor downtown sculpture exhibition. Um, but now, it's not going to be carried over, right? Right. Yeah. So this is the budget for this year. But I want to make it clear that, yeah, that money was not spent last year, frankly, because the, the pandemic just walloped everybody. So that was just, you know, everything was sort of shut down as we tried to figure that out. I just want to be clear on that. Right. So, Sorry. So my question was more about how to execute the business of this group. I mean, we, we, we have a schedule, right? We release the, the grant things. We release the outdoor uh, uh, sculpture thing. We, we release the thing for, for the Phoenix Awards. And, and those dates are, you know, they're dates that we do this every year. And I don't want to, you, you know, I don't think we want to be putting out um, announcements and stuff that we're going to do something that we don't know that we're going to be able to do. So sorry if I sound a little frustrated. I feel like we're sitting on our hands and no one is saying to us, hey, listen, we already know it's going to be the transient guest tax is going to be hit by 50% because of last year. So why don't you guys plan on 50% of your budget? And then we could execute uh, something. But right now it feels to me like it's Hey, last year you didn't get to spend any of your budget, and this year we don't know. Um, what I will say is, one, I'm in the same boat, and last year I wasn't sure how to implement things. Tracking the transient guest tax grants was a, a, a real challenge because I was in touch with all of these event people trying to figure out if they were going to be able to change their event or execute their event, and obviously with the health orders and things, things were constantly changing. So it was a nightmare. And as Michael pointed out, I think we, we funded less than half of the um, awarded events. Um, some happened before the pandemic and some figured out ways of functioning after. The best answer I can give you, Michael just alluded to it, is um, you know the commission is actually reviewing the budget quarterly, trying to track trends and that type of thing, including TGT. Um, cause I ha now have, um, transient guest tax grants. And of course, everybody wants their funding for their event. So I've divvied that up, um, and I'm looking at it quarterly, um, and trying to make sure that, you know, if somebody got awarded X amount of dollars, but it turns out we don't have, we'll have 50% of that available. Then I think it's reasonable to adjust across the board and not just penalize individuals. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that. With that in mind, like the outdoor downtown sculpture exhibition, typically we do an RFQ and we get people on board. We may not be able to implement 10 sculptures all at once. We may have to say, okay, we, we won't be able to do all 10 of these. So we will do X amount depending on what funding is available at that point. Um, so that's my best answer. I have not gotten clear direction from the city commission or the finance department at this point, just because I, you know, so much of this is, is reading tea leaves and um, is speculative. So I, I, Jerry, I appreciate your frustration. I would dare say the $3,000 for the Phoenix award is secure. 
Um, I think that that's, you know, that's small enough that I wouldn't be too worried about that. So, so, we, so you think we can proceed with that? Um, yeah, and so, I think we can implement so, a process for the community arts grant program. Um, I obviously need to get on that sooner than later if we want to implement it. Um, and then also the outdoor downtown sculpture program. Yeah, so I see I see two two sort of things here. I see, okay, so for the outdoor uh, sculpture exhibition, I can see how we we could say, well, you know, we can't um, we can't have groups of people walking around, you know, right now from from sculpture to sculpture or whatever. But I mean, it, it, it certainly seems to me that we can do that. This is part one of my of my statement. We we can do that in a COVID way. We could do the grants also that way. I mean, we no, we can't fund a busker festival, <laughs> you know, uh, during during the pandemic or whatever. But we could fund some things, maybe some of the storefront things or whatever, if 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 they're COVID, you know, pandemic friendly sort of things. So that's part one. Part two is is more to me is more the root uh, uh, of the situation is is will there be funds available? And I hear you saying, and I appreciate you saying that the three thousand dollars for the Phoenix Awards because we we have slipped by a year on that, so it would be really nice to get that one out there where we can get artists uh, submitting ideas for that. Um, but the other two even if they were able to do them in a COVID friendly way, COVID friendly, it sounds like a really weird thing to say. Um, but, but then would there in, in turn be any level of funding for that? And, and when would we know that, I guess? All right. I'm starting to repeat myself, but. Yeah, sorry. Clear as mud. Um, I do think, we can adapt our current methodology to articulate some of these challenges so that when artists respond, say, to the RFQ for the Outdoor Downtown Sculpture Exhibition, they understand that there's no guarantee. And we did this with the Tierney Guest Tax Grant. There's a whole caveat there explaining, you know, here's the situation. It's beyond anybody's control. We cannot guarantee that we, can, we will be able to, to fund this fully. Um, and that's in every agreement too, you know, that the city can't make that absolute promise. Okay. So I think with the, you know, outdoor down, and I'm looking at our committee updates and I know outdoor downtown sculpture exhibition is on there. So um, we can continue this conversation at that level as well. But yeah, I would say at this point, I don't see any major changes in the budget as far as your request. Um, how you use that money is, is you know, programmatically will be different, but I just want you to be aware of the circumstances. And I think Michael's right. We're not really going to see returning to 2019 level kind of circumstances until 2022 and later. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that. This is Marlo. Is there any, um, the mentality use it or lose it? Like, would that come into play? Like if we wait too long, is there anything where we would be missing out? I'm just using myself as an example where I didn't know that the TGT grant for the Free State Festival was use it or lose it. Like had I known either I use it now or it'd be gone, I probably could have found a way to make Free State Festival virtual during the summer of 2020. And so now I'm like, okay, if we don't move on the outdoor sculpture uh, exhibit, you know, exhibition now, is there a chance that it just won't happen this year? Yeah. Um, like I yeah, said, yeah. All the uh, all these funds are only annual. They do not carry over. Um, so if we don't use it, it would it would um, go away. But again, as Michael points out, it's it's funding a variety of things. Um, so and it is allocated. I mean, the intention is is there. Okay. And I express my frustration <laughs> at the fact that the city can't find forty nine thousand dollars for arts and culture, but can find $220,000 to fund new speed limit signs. You may express your frustration. Thank you. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Just um, so I can add to that, Mary, it's where the funds are coming out of. Right, that's important. That's, thank you, Michael. That's actually really important. 
And is there any hope that that could change this year? <laughs> like our funds could come from a different pool of funds than the TGT grant? That's, that's up to the that's up to the commission and you know they're not indicating any interest in changing that at this point i think we we keep asking that question porter and what we're looking for is a different answer i know and, uh, you, keep, <laughs> you keep giving us the same answer well and i think as michael understands you know pre-pandemic this was not a bad fund to be funded from um Post-pandemic is a whole different set of circumstances. So, um, you know, yeah, that's where we are. Uh, in the interest of time, I see that it's 9-14. Um, I don't know if, if we want to go through the committee things. I know that these three committees were either going to meet or planning to meet. And maybe we just touch base on those. And then I also know that Jordan has this um, draft statement that, that we want to talk about as well. Thank you, Michael. All right, any updates on the culture chat? Quick, quickly. I forget who are. Who's our culture chat group? All right, I can't find it and not he Oh, here we go. Hearing anything on that? Maybe we can look to the community arts grants. So I'm, I'm looking at the minutes from last time for culture chat. I know that Marlo, Jordan, Sarah, and James had previously met, but I think we we didn't didn't some folks commit to being sort of heading up the culture chat for 2021 and it seemed jerry yeah. i know i was a part of that um but i'm having trouble finding in my notes who else was yeah um too. i know that we did not uh end up meeting before this okay. before fair tonight enough. okay Fair enough. I know. You. I remember that Kate Deneen had said she was going to take it, but she's not on this committee anymore. So maybe that just doesn't apply to her. I don't know. Yeah, that was before the uh, retreat. During the retreat, people expressed interest and a group was formed and I, I'm trying to find it too. I can't find it. Um, so I think it sounds like we kind of need to shore up the committees and make sure everybody knows um, which committee they're on. Cause I know there was some changes after the fact. Marlo, I think you had some concerns about being in too many committees. Um, so. Um, I volunteered to chair the cultural plan committee and we have not met, but I did have a question about that cause I did want us to meet, but I wasn't sure because of the, the stuff that we went over earlier. Like, can I send out a meeting invite and my own Zoom link? Or does that have to come from you, Porter? Um, if it's, depending on how many people are in the group, if it's under that six um, and you're meeting as a, and you're meeting as a committee, then you can actually um, email that committee and set up a meeting. You don't have to rely on me for that. Cool, and I can use my own personal Zoom accounts. Yeah, I would say two things. You can do that and or if you need a Zoom meeting, let me know. We do have an account here so I could set up a Zoom meeting for you. 
I think the only one on the committee was Jordan that's here tonight, but I did want to see if we could meet before the next meeting. So I was almost thinking this time frame, like on a Wednesday night, like in two weeks. So, but I'll email you separately about it. And I know Sarah expressed interest in several groups too, and James as well, uh, or no, James wasn't at the retreat, but so. He did email, I think. I think he did via email. Yeah, I think he did. This is Christina. If you look in the minutes on page five, about midway through, I think that's what you're looking for that lays out the uh, commissioners and which uh, committee they've signed up for. So if you want that quick reference. And then I do remember we were talking about um, giving the, the new commissioners an opportunity to join one of the subcommittees and then any of the commissioners that weren't at the retreat. So here's the uh, committees. Um, strategic was Marlo as the chair, Joshua, Jordan, and Sarah. Programming was Jerry, Jordan, James, Sarah, and possibly Mary and Marlo. Um, chair would be selected at a later meeting and then public art was Christine, Christine as the chair, Jerry, and possibly Denise. Denise, I think we thought that you had expressed interest in that in the past, so that you're not locked into that. I'm actually happy to do it. Great. Yeah, and if I was gonna um, join any of these, I think public art is where, where I would fall as well. So Christina, if you can take the lead on that and set up a meeting, I think it would be great with this conversation to look at the outdoor downtown sculpture exhibition and um, kind of start thinking through, um, and I can send you the, um, let me make a note, last year's um, uh, prospectus on that or the, you know, the criteria that we set out and you guys can determine how you want to alter that, including what we said about, you know, doing less sort of, object oriented public art and thinking about more sort of interactive type public art. Sure, I'll be happy to set up a meeting. So it's myself, Jerry, Denise, and Daniel. And this is Dina. Um, I'd be happy to join the public art committee too. It looks like that one um, maybe has the fewest people on it too. So great. I'd be happy to join that too. Okay. I'll, I'll Great, thanks. Meeting request. Okay. All right, so that's public art. And then um, strategic was the cultural plan, Marlo. So you're working on that and you know who your committee members are? Now I do, yes, thank you. Okay. And then um, programming, which I think relates to the, um, uh, was it community arts grant and the um, Phoenix Award? Yes. So we had Jerry, Jordan, James, Sarah, and possibly Mary and Marlo. Mary and Marlo. Marlo, I think you wanted to drop out of that because you're going to focus on the other end. If I'm not mistaken, you have a few other things in your lives keeping life keeping you busy. Uh, Mary, also, I know you're really busy. Um, Explore Lawrence, so. Uh, so we need a chair for that. Um, I will volunteer. There you go. So that check that off. Chair will be selected at a later meeting. <laughs> Uh, let the record show that Jerry has volunteered as chair of this committee. I'll pass that off later, but I have experience with both of those things, so. Great, I think that satisfies that. And yes, if those groups can meet and be prepared to report out in March, that'll be great. And yeah, the good thing is you can do it virtually or by phone, not to say you couldn't do it in a safe, what did you call it, Jerry? A, a COVID safe environment or something? Yeah, um, maybe on a walk on the levee and you know, it's only gonna be negative 10 this week. So right. we however you choose to do that. Walk across the river maybe. Yeah. <laughs> probably not a good idea. Um, okay, 
hold on, now I have clicked on somewhere else. Okay. Uh, it's blank under director's report. Do you have anything for us? Um, the only thing I wanted to share is that if you haven't gone by the Senior Resource Center and the fire station recently, um, if you do go by, you will see a large concrete pedestal. Um, Jacob got that installed before we hit all this very cold weather. Um, the piece, the, the sculpture is actually complete, and he's just waiting for the weather to cooperate so he can get a crane in place and install his artwork. Um, so it's it's moving along and just want to keep you in loop. It may now be delayed for some time under the circumstances. Um, and the other thing is um, Joe O'Connell of uh, Creative Machines is the artist in, involved in the um, police um, headquarters site. And um, he is working toward doing some community engagement meetings himself virtually um, because of the vaccine coming not quite as I thought it might be scheduled. I've been really embroiled in that on the emergency communication side. So we just haven't been able to get into that, but eventually we'll get back to that and start having community meetings um, and work on that. So those are the two things that are still hanging out there that we're still working on. All right, thank you for that. Um, and so we have under our miscellaneous, we have the, um, uh, the letter submitted uh, by Jordan. How do we want to uh, how do we want to do that, Porter? Um, well, I thought I could pull it up, but I can't because it's asking me to log in, which is really weird because I pulled up everything else. It did that. It did that to me today on that link. But if you click on the printable agent a uh, print printable agenda link and scroll all the way to the bottom, the letter is there. Oh, thank you. Um, just a quick note, in the interest of time, because it's it's very late, <laughs> um, and the, the draft um, denouncement that Sarah and I composed is kind of a beast. Um, and acknowledging that our priorities have changed quite a bit, um, probably since uh, the weekend after 1-6 happened in the first place. It might be better to just um, table this until the next meeting. I know, Porter, I'm the one who pushed you to put it on the agenda in the first place, but um, considering we don't have everybody here um, who showed an interest in, in editing it and also, um, just how um, uh, in depth this, this conversation might become, um, it might be best to just uh, move this to March and, and um, commit to editing it since it won't be as time sensitive as, as when we originally composed it. How does that sound? Uh, very reasonable. And I hope that's not a discouragement per se um, but yeah, things have changed and there's an, uh, you know, obviously everything has changed and I hope that it helped a little bit that the city commission did go ahead and craft a letter that was sent to the legislation so that I want to make you all aware of that. Um, so I think that's, that's very, um, very reasonable. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, yeah, appreciate your Jordan, your, you, you all's passion on the, on the topic. Um, okay, so that brings us to adjournment, unless there's any other items that anyone would like to, to bring up. I would like to say before we adjourn, um, as I, as I try to at every one of these meetings, I appreciate your all's willingness to donate your time and your experience and your thoughts to culture and arts in our community. Appreciate it. Appreciate all of you. Agreed. Yes. Thank you all. And I think, I hope everybody's able to do some level of self care um, during these very challenging times. And Denise, I hope your renovations are going well.
Yes, they are. I had to move in the process, so <laughs> it's fine. It's worked Exciting. out really great. So I'm really sorry I wasn't at that retreat, but it was kind of a challenge that weekend. So I've been there and I understand. <laughs> That's good. All right, can I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, Nice moved and Jordan seconded. We'll do it that way. Nice, I like it. All right. So let's just do it this way. Anybody opposed to adjourning the meeting? <laughs> I see no no's, so have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.